Hello, my name is uh, Harsha Shampana, and I'm here with Dr. Guy Weinberg, who received Gaston Labatt Award in 2020. And this interview is part of activities surrounding the founding of the first American Regional Anesthesia Society in 1923 by Gaston Labatt and colleagues. Although this the current organization is uh, not related to the original ASRA founded in 1923, and the current organization, which is founded in 1975, it has been said that the current organization would not have existed in the form it is without the work of Dr. Gaston Labatt and the original ASRA, which was founded in 1923. Um, and I'm here with Dr. Guy Weinberg, and in the next uh, few minutes, we're going to have some very interesting questions answered by Dr. Weinberg uh, through his perspective and lens. Um, thank you, Guy, and it's a privilege to have known you and for this opportunity to interact with you as part of these activities. Um, and um, I'm going to begin with a question um, as I've come across your lecture, which you recently gave um, as part of the um, ASA award that uh, or the talk that you gave uh, recently. And uh, you speak about several black spans in your career um, that have shaped and kind of um, given you the kind of career path that you took. So do you want to um, give us some of the black swans and how they shaped your career and it, their influence on you getting into the career of regional anesthesia? Well, that would be a, a really nice topic to pursue, uh, Harsha, and thank you very much for being my interviewer. Uh, I should mention that you and I have published a paper together, a really, really fun paper to have written and one that I think will have some impact on the uh, on anesthesia practice. Um, and even coining a new term for multiple uses of local anesthetic called melana, which I think is a, a, a useful way to think about that problem. And the talk you're referring to was the um, keynote uh, John Severing House lecture on translational medicine that I gave at the Sears ASA, where I had the opportunity to recount uh, the path, the unexpected path, I should say, to the discovery of lipid resuscitation. And sort of one of, one of the through lines in that career arc was the uh, appearance, as you point out, of black swans. This is a concept first developed by Nassim Talib, based on the idea that these rare high impact events are very important in innovation and discovery generally. And uh, I had experienced a number of these throughout my career and each one ended up re uh, moving my career forward, but not always in a direction or path I anticipated. As far as regional anesthesia, the first one that uh, most was most important for me, Harsha, was an index case, which basically bisected my say 40 year career into two 20 year tranches. There was sort of a before this index case and an after. And that index case was an event where a patient with a rare genetic disease had a very unusual reaction to uh, bupivacaine in that she developed severe last that was out of proportion to the exposure to the drug. She'd only received a small dose of bupivacaine subcutaneously, but had a major clinical reaction to that. So at that time, because I had told the surgeon, I didn't think there would be a problem with uh, have her having a, a liposuction because the exposure to local anesthetics was not likely to be a problem and the general anesthesia for her condition shouldn't have been a problem. I really felt like I had to explain to him why he had to cancel the case because of the patient's malignant arrhythmias. And that really opened the door to my um, interest in studying the effects of local anesthetics on mitochondria because the patient had isovaleric acidemia which is a mitochondrial myopathy. 
and in her case resulted in very very low carnitine stores and so i pursued the hypothesis harsha that bupivacaine might interfere with a carnitine mechanism and therefore could account this effect might possibly account for the clinical observation of local anesthetic toxicity that we see. And to make a long, or I should say very long story short, the reality, what we found was in fact, bupivacaine is a potent inhibitor of the carnitine shuttle. We identified the enzyme that was affected. It's in the mitochondrial inner membrane. And that started an entire research career that as a sidebar also resulted in the discovery of lipid resuscitation. So I'll leave it at that. <laughs> That's just one black swan. Right? I know we don't have hours to go into all the others. So I'll just yeah. leave it at that most important one for me. Thank you. Um, I think it was it was very eventful. I mean, um, I, it's very true of what you talk as black swans um, in our careers. Now, apart from this, uh, you know, direct influence of, um, you know, local anesthetic toxicity to regional anesthesia and your career or your um, involvement in regional anesthesia, were there other influences or what attracted you towards regional anesthesia? So that's a great question. And that is a really good opportunity for me to reflect on the career arc. And that's important, of course, because this is information that I think will help inform the youngsters in the field, people coming up. What, you know, what made Dr. Weinberg's career? Maybe that something similar could happen to me. And I'll tell you that putting the black swans aside for a moment, the career is entirely based on my associations with people, my mentors. So in the case of regional anesthesia, Harsha, my mentors at University of Virginia included Dr. Karen, Harold Karen, who was one of the founders of the modern iteration of ASRA, mm -hmm. John Rawlingson and Cosmo DeFazio, who were both um, double winners. They each had the ASRA Distinguished Service Award and the Labatt. And could you imagine how lucky I was as a resident to have them teaching me regional anesthesia? Mm -hmm. So, and even at the time, I was aware of how special it was to have these three people in my life and pointing me in that direction. But I'm also going to point out two other really important features. One was the family of Azra, that once I became sort of involved in the whole question of LAST and its management and uh, uh, having identified an antidote for that, and becoming uh, invited to speak at ASRA every year, it, there was an opportunity to establish close ties with colleagues throughout the field. And those ties, and I'm going to mention a number of people that are very close to you geographically. Mm -hmm. Vince Chan, right? Anahi Perlis. Yes. Right, they're in Toronto and you're in, you're in Hamilton, correct? Very close, yes. Right down the road as well as Joe Neal and Terry Horlocker and other people, R Rick Rosenquist, Ken Drasner. These, and if the youngsters don't aren't familiar with that name, they should be because Ken Drasner was the person who identified the risk we take in injecting high concentrations of lidocaine specifically into the subarachnoid space through a microcatheter. It's something nobody does anymore, but there's a reason we don't do it. So, um, these are the people that really established my ties and network within the community. And that's something that I would love to pass on to the next generation that this, it's the community that makes all the difference. You know, it takes a village to develop a career. And that was my village. And then finally, I want to point out, in addition to the interaction with my residents, and how important that has been. You know, I teach them, but they also teach me. I wanted to point out there was one really important paper that got me very practically, and from a practical standpoint, involved in regional anesthesia. And it also came out of Toronto. And it was, if you can believe this, a letter to the editor from Alan McFarlane, Anahi Perlis, Ricky Brule, and Vince Chan. And it was titled something on the order of eight ball in the corner pocket. <laughs> 
And the reason I want to mention this is because like another, like another black swan, this is a high impact event, a little teeny letter to the editor that really changed my practice. Because up until then, I had had a lot of trouble making and understanding ultrasound guidance work for me. And when I read that paper, suddenly everything fell into place. There's a place that I can drop the local anesthetic and guarantee a high probability efficacy, as mm -hmm. they said, avoiding the scratch in a very clever paper. So that one paper began my ultrasound guidance journey. And in the next 200 cases, I recorded the, with along with my uh, colleague, Tim Veda Bancour, the, uh, every one of the supraclavicular blocks that we did and went over them carefully. And so then in the six month period after that letter, the editor, it just completely changed our practice and um, allowed us not only to embrace ultrasound guidance, but really modern regional anesthesia. That was, in my mind, the birth of modern regional anesthesia was out of that one letter to the editor. I, I think that's probably heard enough about that now, but... Yeah. No, thank you. I think uh, you you actually um, got into the discussion, which one of my questions was about uh, what some of the great mentors you've had, and you uh, neatly touched upon them, and also spoke about some of the pivotal leaders of regional anesthesia, especially in Toronto, and some, you know, yeah. O'Neill and Rick Rosenquist and others from the U.S. as well. Um, so, you did speak to a bit of this, but do you want to see, um, I want to get a sense of how you feel the regional anesthesia has evolved over the years. Um, I, I see that you have a perspective focused on uh, local anesthetic toxicity. And of course, the advent of ultrasound and other things. So do you want to give some, um, you know? Absolutely. So um, I'm going to take you back um, 40 years when I became an attending, at that time, other than spinal or epidural, if you think about peripheral nerve blocks, Harsha, you were lucky if you could get with, with surface landmarks alone better than 75% efficacy. And so the major problems then, which have subsequently been solved, I think, well, to a large degree, was one of efficacy. I mean, can you imagine... If you were going to put someone to sleep and you only were 75% assured that the, that the propofol or was going to work, that's not acceptable. So regional anesthesia had a big problem. There was a jump up when we started using regularly um, nerve stimulation, but that was also flawed. So maybe it's a, as an example, uh, as a, as a can, canonical nerve block, supraclavicular brachial plexus, with nerve stimulation, efficacy, frequency of efficacy probably went from 75%, in my hands anyway, up to like 90%, but it still wasn't 100%. Until after having done those 200 ultrasound guided blocks, then I could say it was going to be 100% or very damn close. So that was one of the biggest transition is one of efficacy. I think one of the other issues which still comes up but is much less a problem now than it used to be was penetrating the surgical workflow. I mean, surgeons didn't like to do us to do regional anesthesia because it held them up for two minutes. Of course, we all understand the intrinsic paradox there because they could be two hours late and then take two hours longer for the operation than they should. But if we're delaying them by a minute, it wasn't acceptable. So I think it's the work of really important leaders like Santanam Suresh, people with boots on the ground who convinced surgeons that they not only was it an improvement, but they needed the regional anesthesia. So they would open the door to allow us to offer this option to every patient, you know, an improved workflow. And the other thing that I think has been a, 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 a boon over the last 40 years is the advent of acute pain service. Because um, when I first came up, that wasn't really a thing. And of course, in part, it was because our efficacy was so low. But with ultrasound guidance and really understanding uh, technique and methodology much better, as opposed to just surface landmarks and the availability of catheter technique and whatnot, I think the... Um, 
uh, the advent of an acute pain service. That's another really big change. But overall, Harsha, efficacy, you know, success. Yeah, thank you. Um, you, you. You did speak of the great work you've done with ASRA and how ASRA has kind of enriched, especially with the networking, um, you know, opportunities and meeting people, uh, knowledge translation. Um, when it comes to knowledge translation and your activities with ASRA, you know, practice advisories that began with other societies, um, do you want to give some highlights on that? And also, you know, what other perspectives or thinking you've particularly fostered amongst the ASRA community, please? Sure. Once again, it really does get back to community. And I formed a, a very uh, strong bond early on with Joe Neal. He and I worked very closely, starting at a meeting we had at the O'Hare uh, Hilton Hotel, I think, uh, back in 2010, uh, to establish a, a, a standard advisory for treating local anesthetic toxicity. As you probably know, prior to that, there was uh, it was the Wild West. There was nobody knew what to do, and it was an unmet. Uh, medical need really to offer clinicians guidelines as they have for, for instance, for malignant hyperthermia. So when one of these rare, potentially life-threatening events occurs, what, what do you do? And uh, this was a really great learning curve for both Joe and me, uh, not only in terms of establishing the advisory in organizing that, he was probably way more expert than I at, at, at organizing these things. Uh, but in identifying how to make the recommendations more clinically applicable, to make them simple, to make them re reproducible, we put a tremendous amount of effort into that project. And he and I worked together closely up until very uh, the current. You know, we're just going to pass the baton now to the next generation, but for 12 years, we worked very, very closely on that. And I think with the most recent iteration, we really, really made a difference. The next challenge, of course, will be educating. Well, uh, let me give you two items. One is educating non-anesthesiologists about the risks and management of LAST, but also um, for identifying clear-cut uh, guidelines for infusion, catheter infusion or intravenous infusion, based on solid science, that is. Once again, though, it was in overview, it was the community, whether it was Joe Neal or the other members of the working group. Um, I'll just leave it at that. The community has really made the difference. Thank you. Um, it's it's very interesting. I think the You've you've actually answered some of the questions I had in my mind. For example, asking about um, the challenges that regional anesthesia is going to face, although we have evolved greatly, and and some of that could be involving non anesthesiologists and trying to impress upon them the benefits. Um, specifically, if I ask, uh, we also face the question of the long term outcomes which we don't think has been rightly, we don't have the evidence yet as regional anesthesia influences them. Um, do you have any perspectives on that? And you know, when it comes to, for example, there is a friction between saying lidocaine infusion probably has a greater influence on persistent or chronic post-surgical pain versus a regional anesthetic. Yeah, the, um, this, uh, these are questions, let me put it this way. Those are first world problems and we're lucky to have them. You know, initially it was just, can we get this thing to work? Can we get, can we have an acceptable success rate? Well, now we do have that. Uh, can we begin practicing in a way that improves patient safe, that improves patient outcomes and uh, uh, reduces pain? Yes, I think we're, we, we have that. Now we're in the sort of the third level of questions. Can we improve it so in a way that we completely avoid adverse outcomes at the same time that we're improving patient satisfaction and, and analgesia, for instance? And this is when you begin to ask the question about lidocaine infusion or melana, as we referred to earlier, a scenario where patients get intravenous local anesthetic and uh, uh, field 
injections and nerve block injections and lots of different <laughs> and catheter infusions. So uh, the, the, these are the questions that, um, that remain for us to, an, to be answered, hopefully entirely on the basis of science. And that outreach is going to be important because as, as you know, it's very paradoxical, but the most common local anesthetic in the literature now for, responsible for last is lidocaine. And I think that is a sentinel harsha for non-anesthesiologists because that's their favorite local anesthetic to use. And a lot of these cases are occurring in the hands of others. The risk there is that they're not so familiar as are we with the management, a detection, diagnosis, hopefully prevention, and then treatment of local anesthetic toxicity. And it puts the patients at increased risk when they are when they have a syringe full of some a local anesthetic they can view as completely safe. And especially for the patients, even when they are not overdosed, the patients who are specifically at risk because of um, a lowered threshold to local anesthetic toxicity, you know, increased sensitivity in other words. And we see this, we see even young people who are asymptomatic with a, we're not entirely sure what biochemical um, pathway they have a problem with, but there are people otherwise asymptomatic who have very, very low threshold to local anesthetic toxicity. How can we identify them ahead of time? And how can we make sure that people know how to address the problem of last when it does occur unexpectedly? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, I think I have two um, somewhat different non-scientific questions. And, and one of that is, um, what was your initial reaction when you got to know the news that you were the recipient of the Gaston Labatt Award in 2020? Well, um, I think the first reaction, Harsha, after this initial surprise wore off, I was like, that was- You're, you're truly deserving. I must first well, say that. thank you. But at the time, it was a little shocking, like, really, me? That's fantastic. And uh, I think that the, um, first of all, was pride for my parents, who have since passed away, but my, uh, the, at what their son accomplished, but pride on their behalf, uh, you know, because we all want is we all want to do well for our parents, even if they're not here anymore. Uh, F, I'd say after that, it was really um, humbleness, because if you look at the list of winners, that's a pretty impressive list of names. And I encourage everybody to go back and look at the, you can easily find it online, the list of Labatt winners. And in my case, it includes many of my mentors and many of my colleagues. So, uh, you know, but as I mentioned, both uh, Kaz DeFazio and John Rowlingson are previous Labatt winners. And just to be in the same company as that, many very famous uh, authors of textbooks also, it's just to be in the same company of them, left me very, very um, proud, I would say. That's all. Thank you. Um, my last question, again, is, you know, we, we when we look at someone's career like you, we, we always, you know, established, accomplished, but I, I realized that you also said some very important thing in your lecture, the Severing West lecture, was that patience. And um, some individuals are, you know, the, the, the black swans and different shape things shape their career. Um, I want to ask, uh, take your uh, comments for the younger generation, more so on that aspect as to how to build a career. Patience is still the key, although we want everything to happen mm -hmm. fast. And, and secondly, the influence of travel. And I, you know, it's interesting. You you travel to Nepal. You know, we we ask questions in our careers where it is going, which direction. And I think it would be great to hear from you on those aspects of career path. Absolutely. Um, you know, uh, as far as the patients. And by the way, I am still, even as recently as yesterday, discussing with people I mentor the importance of patience. And it, it reminds me a little bit of what my grandmother used to say, which is, um, you know, the, she would say the days drag, but the years fly by. Uh, what I would say is that if you accomplish even a little something every day, at the end of a year, you look back, you get a lot, you did a lot. You, 
But at the end of a decade, you can do even more. And at the end of your career, it's even more. Just accomplishing a little bit every day, it really adds up in a way and compounds in a way that you can't predict ahead of time. Um, as you say, everybody wants to get, wants to, wants to be there now, but it's just not going to happen. It's you, you have to be patient. And it's easy for me to say, because I for me it's all in the rear view mirror now. But looking ahead uh as a youngster, it's much more difficult to accept. But trust, trust me, everybody, it's really true. Be patient. Things will happen. Just a little bit every day, a little bit of an accomplishment every day. As far as Nepal is concerned, uh, you know, that was a life-changing event because it, that's that was my geographical black swan and cultural black swan because the people of the country, and this is in 1981, spring. Uh, so it's a lot of, a lot has happened in Nepal since then, but uh, it was a, a, a really um, a tremendous uh, watershed experience for me. I also met one of my, one of my great mentors, a, a gentleman named Bill Dougal, who was a, 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 an adventurer, an outdoorsman, uh, one of the original board directors of uh, REI, and uh, uh, just, a, just an amazing individual. So it was an important experience establishing that friendship with him in Nepal. And as he pointed out to me, the people of Nepal, at least at that time, they didn't have anything. It wasn't even a third world country. They hadn't left the starting blocks, but the people were not poor. They did not consider themselves poor and they did not look or act poor, even though they had nothing. And so it was the difference between material possessions and, and, and wealth, <laughs> real wealth that he taught me. So that was what Nepal meant to me as long ago as that was. No, thank thank you so much, uh, Guy. It was a real privilege to you know spend these uh, few moments asking you questions that are going to give us valuable insights in your career and your influence on Astra, vice versa. Um, you know, again, I thank Astra for providing me with this opportunity. I, I raised my hands up as soon as I knew it was you. <laughs> And uh, yeah, again, I, I, I thank and I, I wish to keep on interacting with you and learn from you. Of course. Thank and you. I will learn from you. And uh, we can write another paper at some point. That I think we've already started. Uh, there was a good paper in the, going in the right direction. Um, uh, I would say I have to give a special shout out to my friend, uh, Rick Rosenquist, who <clears throat> he was president of ASRA when he invited me to my very, very, very first ASRA as a lecturer and uh and it's kind of funny you'll appreciate this that my very first lecture was on the last day in the early morning eight o'clock i think in the morning and this might have been i don't know 1999 or 2000 or something and i don't think there was anybody in the audience maybe one person or two people <laughs> But that was my first, and so and it was Rick Rosenquist who invited me. So thank you, Rick. And uh, that was, so I started in a very it was a very small start, <laughs> and so now to the guest on Labatt Award all the way. So a great a great trajectory for me. And if I had one word to say for Azra, it was uh, it's been a great family for me because these are my people. You know, I, there was an intimacy with both Azra and Ezra that I, hopefully I'm allowed to say that, Azra and Ezra that you can get because it's small and personal network that you don't really have so much at ASA where it's, you know, at a meeting annually, it's 10,000, 15,000 people or more. So Ezra has been a great community for me and uh, I really appreciate it for everything they've done for my career. Thank you. You have a wonderful day. Take care. Thanks, Harsha.